Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to open the second day of the conference on the Versailles Peace Treaty. The program of today will take up many aspects of the introductory statements of yesterday. We will first look at the political structure established by the peace treaties, the League of Nations as a political and legal framework for international exchange and the stabilization of the world. Here, the builders and negotiators of the treaty tried to overcome the weaknesses of the pre-war system which had not prevented the war, the Urkatastrophe to which Ambassador Kraft alluded yesterday. The peak of the new system was the idea of making the war illegal and to replace the recourse to war by a system of mandatory peaceful settlement by negotiation and arbitration as it was agreed by the Brian Kellogg Pact of 1928. Here, the diplomats after the World War within the League of Nations tried to establish a more balanced system. The minority systems we are going to address this morning were equally an attempt of the international community to control and to moderate the consequences of changed frontiers in Europe and worldwide. Coming back to the opening speech of Amb Ambassador Perdue, one might get the impression that the diplomacy prevailed in the mid and late 1920s. In the afternoon, the establishment of the larger economic framework will be addressed. Trade law, labor relations, and the role of private law, including commercial arbitration, in the building of a stable economic structure. Until today, some structures established after the First World War are still functioning, and the modern world is profiting from them, to take up some of the reflections of Professor Berman. However, one should not forget that the building of this framework was made in severe and sometimes catastrophic circumstances of hyperinflation and the Great Depressions in the end of the 1920s. These repercussions were largely triggered by the economic consequences of the war. Just to mention the large destructions in Belgium and in the north of France, the idea of Article 231 of the Versailles Peace Treaty that Germany was comprehensively responsible for the war and its consequences and had to fully compensate the losses, including the pensions of those who had been killed and their families. The reparation system, which had been elaborated in a thorough and very sophisticated legal way, immediately triggered political resistance and adverse economic consequences. The reparations became a recurrent issue of diplomatic conferences during the 1920s. They finally ended up in the 1930s with a young plan, at a moment when it was politically too late to settle the financial drawbacks. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference is about history and law. We are looking at the Versailles Peace Treaty as an attempt to overcome political and economic consequences of wartime by the law. We all know that the first attempt of settling conflicts through the law was a failure. Being jurists, we should not forget that the legal mechanisms are always dependent on political and economic factors and, as we learned yesterday, on the actors involved in the political struggle. Nevertheless, it is my conviction, and it's our conviction, that one can learn from the past and try to avoid some mistakes made, as it was made after the Second World War, and maybe the London Conference on the Journal External Debts in 1953 was an example in this sense, and we will finally address this topic too. Ladies and gentlemen, to his great regret, Johann von der Wald cannot be here this morning. He is unfortunately sick. But I'm very grateful, we are very grateful that Valerie Rousseau has agreed to chair the morning set session. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this first panel on the historical background 
Um, and this perspective will allow us to fully understand the context of the Versailles Peace Treaty. Um, working on memory in international relations, I'm fully convinced uh, that we need history. I mean, empirical facts, right? Today more than ever. And um, so it is a pleasure for me to, to be here with you and to introduce you to the two first speakers of the day. The panel this morning will be divided into two parts. Um, the first deals with the League of Nations and the second concerns the political termination of war. Um, Dr. Thomas uh, Grant and Professor Michael Callahan uh, will be the first speakers this uh, morning before the coffee break. Dr. Grant, uh, you are a senior research fellow of Wilson College and a fellow of the Lauterpacht Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge. You are presented as both a generalist in international law and a specialist uh, focusing on international dispute settlement and history of international law. Welcome. And Michael Callahan, uh, you are a professor of history and professor of leadership studies at Kettering University. You are the author of numerous books, chapters, papers um, on the League of Nations. You seem to be incontournable, we would say in French, on the issue. So your book on the League of Nations, International Terrorism, British Foreign Policy, 1934-1938, will be published soon and we look forward to it. So now, can I, you too, yes, I guess. <laughs> so we are now uh, turning to you, Dr. Grant. Shall you stand up and talk to you? Thank you very much. Excellent seats, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much um, for that kind introduction and thank you to the Max Planck Institute uh, for Procedural Law and to their excellencies, the ambassadors of France and Germany uh, in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg for bringing us together uh, and for your invitation uh, to speak. Uh, the organizers of the conference have asked me to address the League of Nations as a universal organization. Now, the main theme of the conference today and tomorrow is dispute settlement after the First World War, and so it is appropriate to consider the League as it relates to the efforts at that time to build new mechanisms of dispute settlement. We tend to think of World War I as the end of a social order, and 1919 as the start of something very different. As Professor Nathaniel Berman reminded us last night, it seemed, in his words, as if everything had changed. Even so, in and after 1919, vestiges of an earlier epoch remained. This was no less the case in regard to international law than to other aspects of the social order. Because we are speaking this week about dispute settlement and because equality of parties is one of the absolutely indispensable principles in judicial and arbitral procedure, it is salient for present purposes to recall that certain vestiges of sovereign inequality remain very much visible in and after 1919. It was still accepted that not all states were equal, even in the formal legal sense. Inequality was visible in the Treaty of Versailles. Now, part five of the treaty, the military, naval, and air clauses famously placed Germany under special restraints. There were also the financial clauses and the articles relating to internationalization of some of the water courses, the rivers that flow through Germany. But those constraints were the substantive provisions and rules of the treaty. In themselves, they did not necessarily entail a loss of sovereign equality. Less often noted, are the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles that really did directly reflect a formal juridical imbalance in the relations among states. Now, interestingly, some of the most striking examples may have related to third states, that is to states not actually party to the treaty. For example, Germany in Article 142 reaffirmed that it recognized the French protectorate in Morocco. In Article 147, it did the same in respect of the English or British protectorate in Egypt. Morocco and Egypt, under protectorates, were not possessed of the full scope of rights that we expect a state today to hold. Now, again, last night we heard from Professor Berman about the Rif Rebellion 
which took place in the Spanish and French protectorates of Morocco. So also sometimes overlooked are the guarantee provisions of Article 433 regarding Eastern Europe. German troops were to remain in the Baltic states, even after the armistice, until the principal allied and associated powers said otherwise. One might ask whether this is consistent with sovereign equality. Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, the Baltic states, were not parties to the Treaty of Versailles, but under Article 433, very large numbers of foreign troops remained in those territories, effectively under the imprimatur of the victorious powers. So even though the Provisions such as these could still be included in a treaty, or perhaps because provisions such as those could still be included in a treaty, sovereign equality was a topic of high interest at the time. If we turn to the third, third edition of Lasse Oppenheim's International Law, we read the following. The equality before international law of all member states of the family of nations is an invariable equality derived from their international personality. Whatever inequality may exist between states as regards their size, population, power, degree of civilization, wealth, and other qualities, they are nevertheless equals as international persons. Oppenheim went on to say that sovereign equality had three consequences. He expressed the three consequences as follows. First, Whenever a question arises which has to be settled by the family of nations, every state has a right to a vote, but to one vote only. Second, legally though not politically, the vote of the weakest and smallest state has quite as much weight as the vote of the largest and most powerful. And third, according to the rule par in param non habit imperium, no state can claim jurisdiction over another full sovereign state. Oppenheim here expressed the first two points in terms of voting procedure. The third is a matter of jurisdiction. The third edition of Oppenheim was published in 1920. The League's first assembly had met on 15 November 1920. The first session of the council had been in January. It is of some interest that Oppenheim at that time was speaking of sovereign equality as a matter of voting procedures and then linked the point to jurisdiction. Now, to be sure, there were situations before the League came into existence where states might cast formal votes. Diplomatic conferences well before 1914 had sometimes been conducted under voting procedures. But it was not self-evident that the way to speak about sovereign equality was to speak about voting procedures. This begins to suggest that the covenant of the League was indeed inspiring a different way of looking at things. With the covenant, the idea started to take hold that the international relations might now come under the rule of law. Moreover, the League appeared to promise that international relations would be institutionalized as well as legalized to a degree heretofore unknown. And so it was becoming natural to speak about sovereign equality as a matter of procedural equality. Equality as effectuated by the League of Nations was an aspect of the topic which indeed drew particular attention from scholars. Schucking and Weyberg addressed it in Die Satzung des Volkerbundes, Georges Sell in Les Origines et l'Ouvre de la Société des Nations, Edwin Dickinson in his work on sovereign equality published around the same time in the U.S. This association between the League, sovereign equality, and dispute settlement, I would like to suggest, was not limited to the writings of publicists. To consider the association, it helps to recall how the Treaty of Versailles, the Covenant of the League, and the dispute settlement machinery of the interwar era were connected. Ambassador Perdue last night reminded us how the Treaty of Versailles was in fact one of a series of treaties. Part one of the Treaty of Versailles was a common part repeated and incorporated into each of them. It was in part one that we find the Covenant the Covenant of the League. And the Covenant of the League was, if one may speak figuratively, a sort of long preamble to the peace itself, or at least to the written instruments whose purpose had been to secure the peace. As to the dispute settlement machinery, the main organ was the Permanent Court of International Justice. My friend Christian Toms, a little bit later, is going to be telling us about the court. I don't want to trespass on Christian's brief, so just a brief word about the Permanent Court. The Covenant itself did not bring the court into being. Instead, it was Article 14 of the League uh, Covenant that required the Council to create the court. 
Now, this stands in some contrast to the ICJ, which the UN Charter brought into being as a principal organ of the UN. The linkage between the PCIJ and the League was not quite so tight. We should be careful, however, not to overstate the degree of separation. Article 13 of the Covenant provided for referral of legal disputes to the permanent court. Article 14 provided for advisory jurisdiction upon initiative of the, of the Assembly or the Council. These are examples of the nexus between the League and the court. There was a less direct, but I think perhaps just as important, connection between the League of Nations and the dispute settlement that was then taking shape. This was in the character of the League as a permanent international body predicated on the equality of its participants. Equality in the League was reflected in its substantive rules and in its procedures, including in particular the rules and procedures regulating participation. The rules and procedures regulating participation, I think, merit a few observations today. There was a threshold question about participation that the state's parties to the peace conference needed to answer if they were to build a permanent international body of states. They needed to say what states would be the members of the body. They answered that question in two parts. First, they included an annex to the covenant, and in the annex they set out a list of states, which Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the covenant designated the original members. Then there was the possibility of the League admitting further states, states in addition to the original members. Admitting a state would require agreement of two-thirds of the assembly. Admission also required that a state seeking admission shall, quote, give effective guarantees of its sincere intention to observe its international obligations and accept such regulations as may be prescribed by the League in regard to its military, naval, and air forces and armaments. In principle, at any rate, any state was able to meet such requirements. There was no special reference to the defeated or enemy states, even the mandates provision, Article 22, which addressed certain territories and colonies of Germany and the Ottoman Empire, referred to the change of status of those territories and colonies as, quote, a consequence of the late war, saying simply that they, quote, have ceased to be under the sovereignty of the states which form, formerly governed them. The language here was neutral. It did not place any special disability on the defeated states, and it did not address the defeated states as a special class. As to participation by states in the procedures of the League, the equality of states was guaranteed in the Assembly under Article 3, Paragraph 4 of the Covenant, quote, at meetings of the Assembly, each member of the League shall have one vote. The Council was a little bit different. The principal allied and associated powers were guaranteed membership in the Council. Further members were selected by the Assembly. So a degree of unequal treatment was entailed by the manner in which the League constituted its Council. This might remind us of the UN Security Council with its permanent five members. However, each state in the League Council had one vote, and at least as a formal matter, each vote was equal. The Covenant in this way placed the member states on the same procedural footing, even in its Council. Also of interest is the clause in Article 1, Paragraph 2 that described the entities that were eligible for admission to the League. Now, the UN Charter, in its Article 4, Paragraph 1, on admission of new members, does not distinguish between states, so long as they're peace-loving. The Covenant of the League, by contrast, indicated that the entities that may become a member of the League included any fully self-governing state, dominion, or colony. So, perhaps, potentially, there were three possible subjects under Article 1, Paragraph 2 of the Covenant, states, dominions, and colonies. It might be that the modifying phrase, fully self-governing, was actually the center of gravity in Article 1, Paragraph 2. The requirement that the entity be fully self-governing, perhaps what was really controlling the matter. On that view, the drafters in truth had it in mind to require independence, an independence tantamount to statehood. And nevertheless, if we look at the practice, there was a degree of openness as regarded membership in the League. As at 1919, the dominions that belonged to the British Empire, states, colonies, dominions, were in the process of attaining full independence. But even as to the most advanced dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, 
it could be asked whether at that time, the very beginning, full independence, the process of full independence was really complete. As to India, which was a member of the League, the process of independence clearly was not complete. India was not an independent state in 1919. Uh, it was, however, by virtue of its inscription in the annex to the covenant, a full member of the League. The only dominion to actually be admitted after the adoption of the covenant under paragraph two of Article I was the Republic of Ireland, uh, the then Free State. It's interesting to note that once the Free State was admitted, its delegates were extremely careful uh, in Geneva to protest actually quite vehemently at any, even the faintest suggestion that they were less than a fully independent state. Beyond that, the possible openness of the membership provisions of the covenant remained only that, a possibility but not a realized fact. Two states that were plainly, clearly states, Afghanistan and Ethiopia, discovered that gaining admission, if you were not an obvious member of the club, was an uphill battle. The League did admit both of them, but it seems only rather begrudgingly. The subsequent maltreatment of Ethiopia in the League at the time of the Italian invasion was one of the low points in the period of the League's decline. Other national communities, further at the margins of international relations, asked for admission, but were refused, or actually not even answered. There were the independent states at the edges of the former Russian Empire, for example. Ukraine's pleas to the League were emotionally moving, uh, but ultimately did not move the assembly to admit Ukraine. Georgia and, uh, and Armenia were not admitted either. When the King of Yemen wrote to his counterpart, Edward VIII. You can, historians can probably figure what month that was. There weren't very many. It was a very short time that there was an Edward VIII. The King of Yemen wrote to Edward VIII, and he asked about admission to the League. The matter of Yemen was ultimately referred by the British government to the British governor of Aden, an actually rather minor colonial official. There is no record that Yemen's request ever even received consideration in Geneva. Now, this is not entirely to depreciate the developments toward greater equality which took place under the covenant. As I've already noted, the formal equality of states in the assembly and council uh, 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 was one aspect of this. There were other examples as well. Article 18 of the covenant provided for the registration of treaties. This was the precursor of Article 102 of the UN Charter. Now, at first glance, treaty registration might not appear to have anything to do with universality of participation. But it was not only members of the League who sometimes registered treaties. States not parties to the covenant from time to time communicated treaties to the Secretariat. And there was perhaps some more. Arnold McNair proposed that the practice of registering reservations and objections might actually evolve into a system of treaty certification as against fundamental breaches of international law, a sort of permanent advisory procedure to test the lawfulness of the treaty engagements of states. McNair's proposal was ahead of its time. It's ahead of our time, too. It nevertheless highlighted another way in which participation in the functions of the League tended to support international dispute settlement, even though Article 18 never entailed a system of formal, centralized scrutiny of treaties, it did prescribe an open and transparent procedure. Under that procedure, a state, regardless of its size or political power, could comment upon and, as it wished, object to treaties, including treaties to which it was not a party. The earlier practice of secret treaty making, treaties done in secret, never published, had often been used to derogate the rights of third states. In this way, secret treaty making had undermined sovereign equality. Article 18 tended instead to support it. And there were still other steps toward equality in a wider social sense, going beyond the treatment of states in the League. There was Article 7 of the Covenant, which provided, quote, all positions under or in connection with the League, including the Secretariat, shall be open equally to men and women. Uh, seen through present day highs, this provision doesn't look very ambitious but it needs to be read as part of the social milieu in which the covenant came into force. To give you a taste of that milieu, you might look at the first volume of the Cambridge Law Journal, February 1920, so the year of the opening of the assembly. The journal that month reported on two debates in the Pembroke College Cambridge Law Society. 
the Michaelmas term debate was on the following motion. That in the opinion of this house, the power of women has increased and ought to be diminished. Two pages. The exercise of power. The motion prevailed. But they came back the next term. In the Lent term, the motion in the same, in the same debating club was, quote, this house welcomes the advent of women on the jury. That motion was defeated by, quote, a substantial majority. So this was a time in which even the most basic propositions of interpersonal equality had not been settled. The provision in Article 7 of the Covenant, opening league positions equally to men and women, I think is a more significant step than it might at first appear. Now allow me, if you will, in the short time remaining, to come back to why this movement toward equality, modest as it was, might have been significant to the dispute settlement machinery emerging after 1919. I'd like to suggest that dispute settlement was assisted, if in subtle ways, by the movement toward equality, in particular by the sovereign equality of participants in the League and the relative, if still incomplete, openness of the League to new participants. A political organ may be governed by rules that give some states more power and more rights than others. We see this, for example, in the system of quotas for member states in the International Monetary Fund. Such an arrangement is perfectly able to coexist with a mechanism for the settlement of legal disputes that operates on the principle of equality. The procedures of ICSID are no way frustrated by the weighted voting procedures of the IMF. Political organs and judicial or arbitral organs are different things. Each operates on its own terms, to be sure. And so the existence of the League of Nations under rules that treated the states comprising it as equals was not necessarily linked to the creation of a machinery for interstate adjudication and arbitration. But if instead of the rules actually adopted in the covenant, the League instead had adopted a restrictive approach to participation and had adopted rules giving some members weighted voting, what would the landscape have looked like? Such an arrangement would not necessarily have impeded the functioning of a separate international court or arbitration mechanism, but in the circumstances that existed, I think it was significant to choose the more open and more balanced approach. Against the backdrop of the existing social milieu, the creation of a political organization predicated on sovereign equality had more significance than it might at first appear. The League was not a perfect organization of state equality. Its record was particularly lacking in respect of states at the periphery. The debacle of Ethiopia was probably the worst example. Nevertheless, an international political body that opened itself as widely as the League did was unprecedented. The openness reflected a commitment to sovereign equality, which, though not complete, lent support to the dispute settlement procedures that were emerging at the time. You can have unequal states in a political body. You cannot in a court. The procedures of a court, if the court is to be worthy of the name, must treat the parties who come before it as equals. The League was a political body, and its creators had all the discretion and all the choices that inhere in political decisions. They decided that their organization should strive to be universal in scope, and its states should participate on a footing of juridical equality. The decisions in this regard were perhaps not essential to the functioning of dispute settlement, but they helped make the environment for judicial and arbitral procedures more congenial than it would otherwise have been. The rules and procedures of the League in respect of participation in it, in this way, helped set the stage for the dispute settlement machinery that followed. Thank you. Does, does it work? Thank you very much. For, you respected perfectly the timing. I'm very grateful. And thank you for the insights that you gave. Shall we turn to you now? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. You hear me all right? Yes. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I thought I'd give you a little history lesson. <laughs> On October 9th, 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia was assassinated as he arrived in Marseille to begin a state visit to France. 
Louis Bartou, the French foreign minister, was wounded during the chaos and died later. Evidence quickly established that anti-Yugoslav terrorist groups based in Italy and trained in Hungary had carried out the attack. The terrorists' ultimate goal was to destabilize the multi-ethnic Yugoslavia and create new nation states. Much like the shooting of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo 20 years before, Alexander's murder sparked an international crisis that threatened the peace of Europe. France supported Yugoslavia, Italy, the Hungarians. In the background were alliances and individual states interested in either defending or changing the European status quo. All of the ingredients of the July crisis of 1914 seemed suddenly there again. While these two terrorist attacks had important similarities, their repercussions were very different. According to its covenant, the main purposes of the League of Nations was to promote international cooperation and to achieve international peace and security. These central aims were in fact accomplished in 1934, an achievement that represents the League at its most effective. With strong leadership from Britain and France, the League made it possible for states to adopt a unanimous resolution that preserved the peace that all sides wanted. During its successful mediation, Geneva also decided to confront the serious problem of international terrorism. Jurists and officials from several countries would spend nearly three years exploring ways to classify specific terrorist acts and conspiracies to commit them as international crimes. These efforts were significant milestones in the history of modern international law and legal procedure. Yet the League's legal response to terrorism was designed to deter and punish emulators of Alexander's assassination, not contend with the sorts of challenges that Hitler posed. In the end, few governments supported Geneva's anti-terrorism project in itself. In contrast to the League's success in preserving peace in 1934, the collective attempt from 1935 to 1938 to combat state-supported terrorism illustrates the increasing limits on the organization's effectiveness. Memories of 1914 underpinned the overall sense of dread in the few, first few volatile days after the terrorist attack at Marseille in 1934. Governments quickly re-examined their policies. Italy and Hungary scrambled to deny responsibility and divert attention, even as evidence increasingly implicated both. If Yugoslavia made formal accusations or issued any sort of ultimatum, a violent reaction would be almost inevitable. The Marseille attack also made the larger question of terrorism a matter of serious public and private debate. While most states routinely condemned political violence and expected the French police to conduct a criminal investigation, some now began to advocate international action against terrorist organizations. Others feared alienating Italy or provoking Hungary, thereby risking an end to plans for greater political cooperation in Europe, especially in containing Nazi Germany and maintaining peace. By 1934, most European statesmen understood that the League could itself never require such international action, particularly not of a great power determined to oppose it. The news from France shocked Britain. After receiving intelligence substantiating Yugoslavia's charges against Italy and Hungary, British Foreign Secretary Sir John Simon exerted British influence to urge calm. He was certain that no state would want to repeat the mistakes of 1914. But Britain likewise wanted no new commitments in Europe and had no intention of addressing the complicated question of state-supported terrorism. The British government's policy in October 1934 was therefore to do what they thought should have happened in July of 1914, joining other great powers to urge restraint and keep the peace despite a provocative act of terrorism. French officials were in a quandary. France and Yugoslavia were allies under terms of a treaty of friendship signed in 1927. The new French foreign minister, Pierre Laval, worried about undermining the League, 
worsening Yugoslavia's relations with Italy or having to take sides publicly between Belgrade and Rome. Like Britain, France was willing to placate both the Italians and Hungarians in order to preserve peace, but was finding this difficult in the face of growing pressure from the Yugoslavs and their other allies in Eastern Europe. The Yugoslav government demanded accountability for Alexander's murder, as well as an international effort to prevent future terrorist attacks. In November 1934, the Yugoslav government, joined by its allies of the Little Entente, Czechoslovakia and Romania, filed a formal request with the League to address the odious crime of Marseille. This appeal put renewed focus on the security provisions of the League Covenant. The Kingdom did not call on the League members to fulfill their obligations under Article 10 to respect and preserve its territorial integrity and existing political independence against an act of external aggression. Instead, the Yugoslavs cited Article 11, Paragraph 2, exercising their friendly right to bring to attention any circumstance threatening to disturb international peace or the good understanding between nations upon which peace depends. Without mentioning Italy or even implicating the Hungarian government, the Yugoslavs accused certain Hungarian authorities of assisting the terrorists who murdered Alexander. As a consequence, the Yugoslavs declared that peace with Hungary was now endangered. But the Yugoslavs also called on the League to act collectively to confront the larger problem of state-supported terrorism. Geneva helped to end this dangerous international crisis. Despite initial reluctance, London agreed that Anthony Eden would serve as rapporteur for the dispute. The League Council met from December 5th to 11th. Yugoslavia and Hungary were not members of the Council, but invoking Article 11 entitled both governments to attend. For two days, their representatives, along with other members of the League, took turns speaking at an open forum. All appealed to public opinion, tried to score political points at home and abroad, staked out negotiating positions, and attempted to bend the League's moral authority to serve their national interests. None of them wanted war, but 1914 had taught them that war could come through miscalculation rather than intent. Publicly addressing disputes at Geneva was meant to diminish that possibility. Council speeches did not resolve the crisis, but they exposed areas of common ground and created conditions necessary to make subsequent private negotiations successful. The Council's resolution, adopted during a special midnight session, made specific and far-reaching proposals for settling the Yugoslav-Hungarian dispute. Behind the scenes, the League Secretariat began the work necessary to carry out technical aspects of the Council's resolution. The Secretary General, Joseph Avenol of France, used his personal influence to put pressure on the Hungarians to ensure the final outcome. The League's achievement, however, had been neither inevitable nor easy. Keeping the peace in 1934 depended on the leading members of the Council. France worked to pacify its Eastern European allies, and Laval was responsible for hammering out many of the details of the final resolution. Italy ultimately only gave half-hearted support to Hungary in favor of other priorities, particularly the promise of an accord with France. Britain portrayed itself as impartial, and Eden was willing to disappoint both sides of the dispute, particularly the Yugoslavs, in order to keep everyone calm and to promote international cooperation. Other states also urged cooperation, while some took the opportunity to defend their opposing interpretations of the Treaty of Versailles. In the end, the Yugoslav government ultimately got what it said were its minimum demands. The Council not only unanimously concluded that certain Hungarian authorities indeed were responsible for aiding the terrorist attack at Marseille, but also required the government of Hungary to punish those found guilty. As part of the price Yugoslavia exacted for overlooking Italy's complicity in Alexander's murder, the Council also agreed to accept a French proposal to examine ways to define, prevent, and punish state-supported terrorism under international law. A committee of experts was created to draft an international convention 
to assure the repression of conspiracies or crimes committed with a political and terrorist purpose, as well as to consider the creation of an international criminal court to try accused terrorists. The Committee for the International Repression of Terrorism first met in Geneva in early 1935. Using the French proposal as a starting point, the committee approved several articles of an anti-terrorism convention. Some of the committee's ideas were bold and innovative. Others only made a confusing and difficult undertaking more so. These deliberations demonstrated that the League could foster international cooperation, but they also exposed deep divisions between and within member states over the definition of terrorism the limits of extradition law, the rights of political refugees, and the practicality of an international criminal court. While initial reaction to the committee's accomplishments was generally favorable, Nazi Germany's unilateral rearmament and remilitarization of the Rhineland, Italy's attack on Ethiopia, and the outbreak of civil war in Spain affected the way many governments approached the subject of international terrorism and altered attitudes towards Geneva in general. Most British officials never supported an international criminal court. Many also were dubious about adopting new domestic legislation to criminalize international terrorism. Yet, it was primarily because Eden had proposed the Council's resolution in the first place that the British government agreed to help draft an international anti-terrorism convention, but were careful not to promise to ratify such a convention. The League's Committee on Terrorism held its second session in early 1936. All of the original members, including Italy and Hungary, participated. Their efforts, however, became increasingly technical and symbolic as governments considered other threats to global peace and security more important. Still, they drafted two conventions, one to criminalize international terrorism and the other to establish an international criminal court. The first convention raised particularly difficult questions in Britain. The Home Office was convinced that Parliament would never accept an anti-terrorism convention requiring any significant changes to British law. Eden, however, now Foreign Secretary, saw diplomatic benefit in cooperating in drafting the conventions and convening a diplomatic conference to consider them, even if ultimately the British government refused to sign or ratify either one. When in late 1936, several other states at the League Assembly attempted to impede Geneva's anti-terrorism project, France and Britain joined to give the experts one last chance to revise the conventions. Preserving the prestige of the League and carrying out the Council's resolutions still mattered to both great powers, even if the anti-terrorism project itself did not. The committee's third and final session was in April 1937. After more than two years of work, the Council accepted the revised drafts and agreed to summon a diplomatic conference on terrorism in November, a decision that fulfilled all conditions of the Hungario-Yugoslav settlement. Eden could claim success, but he and the rest of Europe were already dealing with much larger concerns. When Britain's Attorney General Solicitor General and Home Secretary continue to see legal and political difficulties in the latest anti-terrorism convention, Eden quietly abandoned it. The International Conference on the Repression of Terrorism opened in Geneva on November 1st, 1937. 35 member states, along with an observer from Brazil, attended. Instead of further delaying or diluting the organization's efforts, the delegates produced two conventions that largely preserved and in certain respects even strengthened the expert committee's drafts. 25 governments representing peoples from across Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East and Asia signed the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Terrorism. According to Article 1, acts of terrorism were defined as criminal acts directed against a state and intended or calculated to create a state of terror in the minds of particular persons or a group of persons or the general public. The list of criminal offenses included not only attempts to kill political leaders, but also any willful act calculated to endanger the lives of members of the public. 
The second convention concerning the International Criminal Court received only 13 signatures. Britain did not sign either one. Neither convention received enough ratifications to take effect before the outbreak of war in 1939. From its beginnings, the League of Nations defined peace and security in terms of the experience of the First World War. Geneva handled dozens of disputes, many of which centered on the Balkans. Indeed, managing the myriad sources and symptoms of political violence in southeastern Europe was vital to the organization from its origins. Yet, Geneva's peacekeeping authority was always circumscribed by international power constraints beyond its control. Many statesmen in the interwar period were convinced that if the League had a role to play in international relations, it was to help maintain the peace that all governments genuinely desired, even if this required pressing smaller states to accept unpleasant concessions, sweeping inconvenient truths under the rug, and leaving intractable issues to be sorted out in the indefinite future. The settlement of the dispute between Yugoslavia and Hungary exemplified this conception of the League's utility. Geneva proved it could carry out its essential peacekeeping duty and could do so in constructive and often creative ways. Yet, as with earlier settlements under the auspices of the League, successful resolution of the international crisis of late 1934 was imperfect and limited. It was the sort of diplomatic compromise that states aligned on all sides of an international dispute could choose to accept when genuinely determined to prevent war for fear of where it might lead. Such determination was absent in 1914 and would be again in 1939. The League's capacity to settle international disputes of any sort, however, rapidly dissipated after 1935 as great powers abandoned it and smaller ones lost faith. This erosion of political support also severely undercut Geneva's ability to confront other threats to peace, including state-supported terrorism. Still, Geneva's two anti-terrorism conventions were significant for a number of reasons. Together, they, if ratified, might have given states a way to reduce acts of terrorism by putting greater pressure on governments that harbor terrorists, increasing international police collaboration and intelligence sharing, and making it more difficult for terrorists to acquire weapons and false passports. The League's proposals also could have given governments a means for criminalizing conspiracies to commit terrorist acts while providing an external and more neutral process for prosecuting accused terrorists. But none of this happened. The conventions never prevented or punished state-supported terrorism. Their value was mostly technical and symbolic, largely divorced from the political realities of the late 1930s. The League's legal response to terrorism was a success only in the narrowest sense and went largely unnoticed. But despite devoting decades to the subject, the United Nations, too, has yet to resolve many of the same dilemmas that the League itself identified in the 1930s. Condemning the League as a failure has obscured what the organization actually attained and why that matters. Geneva could not stop Hitler's War of 1939, but it did help in 1934 avert a repetition of the Great War of 1914. Resolving the dispute between Yugoslavia and Hungary demonstrated the, uh, the value of Article 11, perhaps the most effective security provision of the covenant. The League also enabled its members uh, to cooperate in exploring ways to combat state-supported terrorism, a problem that remains among the most important and difficult in international relations. It's my view that in order to assess the Treaty of Versailles, and Geneva's contributions to peace through law after the First World War, it is necessary to know how the League of Nations responded to international terrorism in the 1930s. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to have so, so professional speakers to, as a chair, thank you. It was so clear, both of you, concise, uh, um, insightful. I have plenty of quest questions, but I would like to give you the, f the floor first, if there is any. 
Yes, and then I'll, I'll take the floor. Hello, uh, my name is Parvati Menon and I'm a research fellow here. My question is for Thomas Grant. Um, so with regard to the universal nature of the League of Nations, my question is, firstly, how universal was the League, which was in reality a League of Empires? And I ask this because unlike the United Nations, which established membership under Article 4.1, which has kind of almost become a prerequisite for a state, for, for an entity to be considered a state, if not which they're probably considered rogue states, uh, the League represented a worldview, a Wilsonian liberal imperialistic worldview, which if you didn't agree with, you didn't have to join or you could leave. And uh, the absence of the US turned it into an Anglo-French project, the geopolitics of which was most visible during the Italo-Ethiopian War, where uh, despite all the rules that were in place in the League when one member um, waged war against another, the Anglo-French diplomacy uh, overtook and uh, more the French diplomacy overtook in order to prevent an Italian-German alliance. So it turns out that the geopolitics of Europe trumped global interest or law, uh, which begs the question, was the League of Nations really a predecessor to the European Union and not the United Nations, as is often said? Thank you. Okay, shall we go uh, take, oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, then that's a fascinating way of looking at it. It's sort of, it's, it's sort of the World War I entente plus. Um, <laughs> The thing is, I mean, the architecture built into the covenant could have sustained something different. In practice, it did not. In practice, it turned out very much to be a, a, a less global body than the, uh, in, the, than the covenant uh, might have allowed. And of course, not to forget, the United States was the greatest disappointment because so much of the drafting work had been promoted by Woodrow Wilson, but Russia was a late comer, Germany was a late comer. And let's not forget the withdrawals, because quite a few states that started with a degree of enthusiasm, or at least were willing to give it a chance, uh, left as time went on. Brazil was notable. There was quite a bit of breakdown over the council. Council turned into a source of friction. States that were not in, or were not permanently in, were not very happy with the arrangement and the powers of the council. Uh, so, uh, for, uh, it, from, from the text itself, there's a clear uh, impetus behind a global body, but in practice, uh, it, it became something less. And to call it an Anglo-French project, maybe, that's, maybe it was a little bit more than that, but I, I, certainly by the end, there, there was, it was, it was very, little, very little more than that. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's really a salient point. Thank you. Pierre. Thank you very much. My, I'm Pierre Dajon from Louvain University. Thanks to both speakers for uh, very interesting talks. My question goes to Tom also. Um, uh, e sovereign equality of states as uh, understood in the League. Uh, to what, to, two questions, actually. To what extent do you think that the Hague Peace Conferences of 1899 and 1907 have been uh, somehow laying the ground for uh, that uh, sovereign equality understanding. And second uh, question, uh, we tend to see the charter as an instrument that really provides for sovereign equality. But there is Article 107, the enemy state provision in the charter, which discriminate, of course, against the former enemies. It is probably now a provision that has fallen disuetude, but nevertheless, at the beginning, there was clearly inequality in the text of the Charter between the victorious powers and the rest, and the former enemies, uh, somehow likewise, prolonging the distinction that uh, Versailles introduced. Thank you. Pierre, thank you very much. Yeah, um, so, something I'd, I, I had hoped to bring out was that Whilst we think of 1919 as a fresh start, there were remnants of the old. But it's also the case that everything that was new in 1919 wasn't absolutely heretofore never 
seen. There were traces of development going back 20 or 30 years that is in some sense presaged the interwar experiments. So I think that's a, a salient point. The Hague conferences were very much predicated on the idea that states could come together and act uh, as sovereign equals. In other words, everything new in 1919 wasn't really new, and uh, actually not everything was new. <laughs> uh, and the second point about the, the, the charter, well, absolutely, I mean, the, the charter, um, <sighs> I think they're very, very, one gets the sense that in 1945 there was, there was perhaps a little bit more hard headedness in San Francisco than there had been at Paris in 1918, 1919, in the sense that the drafters of the charter, or going to Dumbarton Oaks, I, I, I should say, the drafters of the charter were aware of just how badly this sort of thing could go. Um, they, they may well have allowed a little bit more overt rail politic into their work. Whereas there was such a such a such a great idealism in 1918-19, I think I think there's some validity to that that historical thesis. Yes, we have two questions, Madame, and then Michel. Thank you. My name is Patricia Clavin. Um, this is a question from Michael with regard to um, the terrorism and the responses to to the Marseille event. I wondered whether because you. You began at the beginning. Of, at the beginning of your paper, you talked about the League's commitment to international peace and security, and I wondered whether, in that response, there was any reflection on the suicide of Stefan Lux in the chamber of the League of Nations as an act against, you know, I mean, as sort of, I mean, it is an act of self-immolation against the Nazism, the racism of the Nazi state. Whether that was folded in in any way to how Eden and states responded to international security. So it's a kind of, I mean, it's a modern question in your history, but I think it's a pertinent one. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm afraid the, 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 the major statesmen, even some of the, the, the smaller players, uh, w w what's happening in 1934 is they are not thinking about even the 30s, they're thinking about 1914. That that entire generation, particularly Anthony Eden, everything, the, uh, the murder of Dolphus earlier, just that, that same summer, uh, there was this, this sense that if war were to come, war would come by miscalculation and accident. That this idea was that the, the First World War had been a mistake, that they had kind of been sleepwalking their way into that war. And many of the statesmen simply said, we're not going to do that again. But I, I'm just so, curious because of the stress on the people, because it's, this yeah. isn't about the death of a leader, is it? This is the death of a, of a journalist or a citizen yeah. who's, who's stateless. Essentially, by this point, he's stateless. So it's that connection to, forgive me, but it's the sort of people. Why are they worried about people? So I'll stop talking. Right. <laughs> and I, th I think, I th yes, and, and all people matter. Uh, but um, I think in this sense, King Alexander mattered because of what he represented. He represented the unification of a new state that many others did not see as a legitimate state. And um, he was assassinated for, uh, in part for political reasons, but also I think for um, uh, an, an attempt to try to carry out by other means what some of the terrorists believe was their own understanding of self-determination of peoples. Uh, that they were, they were motivated by some of the very same ideas, not from the political left, but more from the political right. And um, I, in, in anything that I've seen, the entire focus is on, uh, here we go again. Here, here are the Balkans. Here's, here's too many shades of what we've seen before, and we've got got to learn the lessons from the past. Yeah, do we, do human beings learn lessons from the past? At the same time, that all your, your, your two um, presentations show the importance of strong institutions, not to, be, to become cynical, saying that we don't learn anything from the past and so on. So. Michel? Uh, yes, Michel Erpelding, I am um, MPI Luxembourg. Uh, I have a question for each of the speakers. First, for, for Dr. Grant, um, you spoke about the admission of Yemen to or the, the, the attempt of admission uh, um, of Yemen to the League of Nations. Was there any, in their dealings with the British, was there any uh, mention of slavery? Because that was, for the Brits, that was an important factor. When we look at, back at the talks about Ethiopia joining the League, I mean, the, the British didn't want Ethiopia to join the League because of its slavery laws. 
whereas the French, they, 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 they wanted it to join. Uh, and also when Saudi Arabia asked the British when it was created in 32, Asked the British, can we join the league? They said, well, no, you, you, you're a slave state, so uh, basically don't, don't even try. Um, so it didn't even reach the, 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 the official stage at the league. Uh, I also wanted to follow up on the question by, by Pierre D'Argent about the importance of uh, uh, the, the Hague, um, the Hague um, conferences. What I noticed with regard to Luxembourg, which joined in 1920, there was a whole debate, can a small state like Luxembourg join the league? Isn't it a Lilliputian state or what does it have even the real economy or, you know? So what they said, well, it can basically join uh, because for three reasons. First, because of its strategic role in Europe between Germany and, and France, maybe as a buffer state. Uh, second, uh, because, um, because it has an army, <laughs> a small army, but an army. And thirdly, because, um, because it participated in the 1907 Hague Conference as a full participant. So that was indeed a, a factor for sovereign equality of state, whereas they refused Liechtenstein on that same ground. Um, also because it didn't have an army. <laughs> and the second question to, uh, to Professor Callahan. Now, uh, nowadays, there's lots of talk about the international definition of terrorism, and, you, and the reactions of it are obviously very, it's a very controversial subject. What were the reactions at that time? Uh, was it, what, how did people, liberals, see the project? How did uh, left-wing people see the project? How did the fascists see that project? Because it's a very interesting project also for fascists. So. Um, I would like to know more about the reactions in public opinion about that project. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's actually three, at least three questions. Uh, slavery was very much on the minds of, of particularly uh, the, the government of Great Britain. And it, it, as you suggested, it came into play in deliberations over Ethiopia. It was one of the ha uh, considerations that delayed uh, uh, admission of Ethiopia. Uh, it was also discussed in connection, as you pointed out, with um, Saudi Arabia. The Yemen correspondence is very strange. It's directly from the king to Edward VIII. And a lot of the internal deliberations concern how to deal with this as a matter of protocol. And at the end, they, they, they send it to the, this, this, again, rather minor colonial governor in Aden, said he's the one to talk to. Don't bother us anymore. So it's a little less substantive than the a lot less substantive than the discussions about Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia. But there's something to be there's something interesting in that as well. They didn't even really think the King of Yemen uh, rose to the level of a cabinet discussion. Uh, as respect uh, in respect to the Hague conferences in the small states, one of the interesting things in the treatment of Liechtenstein, as poorly as it was treated, reasons were given. Now these were not reasons like you would expect in a judicial decision or an arbitral award, but it's a little bit more than you would have expected, I think, out of a great power concert, Whereas, where, where you can imagine if a very small, small principality showed up at the doors, it probably wouldn't have gotten a three-point explanation as to why it was sent home without any joy. So I think that, that, that the, the process behind it's rather interesting. The substance of it Obviously, it's disappointing. If you're going to be open to all states and you don't care if it's a dominion, a colony, or another type of state, then why should it matter if it's... In fact, the League confessed. It conceded that Liechtenstein was a state, if I recall those documents. So it's really a bit of a mystery. The reasons given for not letting the very, very small states in do not really line up coherently with the rules. Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. I'll, I'll try to, to sort of lay out some, some general differences, but as, as you can probably imagine, uh, much like the League of Nations itself, uh, where the League meant different things to different people depending on who one was, uh, these uh, proposed conventions uh, to combat terrorism also meant different things uh, to different people for different reasons. Um, it, in general, there were, there were a number of legal scholars who had been arguing since the 1920s that terrorism was indeed a concept, a concept that could be defined, and a concept that could be defined in law. 
but that wasn't a universal view. But there were some uh, legal scholars. Um, I'm thinking of, in particular, of someone from Romania by the name of Vespasian Pella, uh, who argued for an international criminal court, argued for the idea of identifying terrorism as a, as, a, as a crime in the 1920s, long before the terrorist attack at 1934. Uh, there were other uh, scholars, one from Poland that some of you, I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, Raphael Lemkin, who argued that the definition of terrorism is impossible, that the word is a concept, that you can't, you can't um, either define it as a, as a legal term and instead argued that we should not use that word at all, we should use transnational crime or we should use some other word to help describe what, what's going on. So even amongst legal scholars, there was very serious debate of whether or not terrorism was um, something that was definable under international law. Um, for others, either liberal governments, right-wing governments, large governments, or small governments, on the political left, there was, uh, there was resistance to the idea of limiting the possibility of bringing in political refugees. Um, more conservative states wanted to make it harder for what they would call terrorists or terrorist organizations that more democratic or more liberal states, particularly in Western Europe, may have described as uh, 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 freedom fighters would be the <laughs> modern term or uh, you know, political refugees. But there were liberals who were arguing that we need to find more ways to criminalize certain actions that only can be uh, controlled between states. And the model for the anti-terrorism convention for liberals was a very successful convention passed in the late 1920s uh, to control the counterfeit, uh, the counterfeit uh, currency. And this also required governments to coordinate their laws, have police work together, uh, find ways for, for states to be able to agree on certain definitions of crime. And the British and other more liberal states uh, supported that kind of uh, international convention. But you're right, on the, on the right, there were states that saw this as an opportunity uh, to uh, crack down, uh, particularly on uh, conspiracies that they could define quite broadly, on, on terrorists that they could define quite broadly. Uh, Pella himself, who supported an international criminal court that was um, very forward thinking in a number of ways in terms of, of international law, himself hated labor unions and wanted to define terrorism in a, such a broad way to sometimes include strikes. If laborers tried to destroy uh, transport, interrupt uh, communications, broadly defined, states could see that as a, as a definition of terrorism. Uh, 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 as, as Italy was still participating in this uh, project before they dropped out, they too saw an advantage here in defining conspiracy in such a way uh, that might allow them to uh, to find uh, people who might want to kill Mussolini as, as terrorists. Um, and as, as a final point to that, uh, to, to show how muddy all of this became even for liberals and conservatives as the years passed here, the international context changed the way that even some liberals thought about this problem as the Spanish American, or sorry, the, the Spanish Civil War broke out. Uh, when, when does a civil war begin? Who precisely is a terrorist? Even some legal scholars changed their mind between 1934 and 38 about that. And there are even some who began to argue in Britain, maybe we don't want to define terrorism here because maybe it would be a good thing to be able to help support groups that want to kill certain political leaders. <laughs> and this would maybe solve a lot of problems for Britain and France if some happy terrorist were to kill Hitler or Mussolini and that maybe it wouldn't be such a good idea for Britain to, to support any ways that would hamper that. Yeah, indeed. So contemporary issues, I think. Anyway, any other question? We still have five minutes. Or we can simply enjoy five more minutes for a tea or a coffee. So uh, let me please, jo uh, please join me uh, to thank our two speakers. I think that they were great and so respectful for the audience. Thank you. Thank you.